Yeah, so are you, so are you. Um, Thank you. Now you so can I explain? Yes. yes, before I have the honor of delivering the fourth Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture, uh, we have a little ceremony to perform here because in my hometown of Balana, there are about 250 people watching us this evening. And they're watching because they had been hoping that Arch would be able to come to Balana when he came to Ireland for a meeting of the elders uh, in May a year ago. But unfortunately, Arch wasn't able to come to that meeting and uh, had to cancel the meeting and therefore couldn't come to our hometown of Balana. What he was going to do there was to bless a big welcoming stone with a plaque on it, which would be a welcoming stone for the Mary Robinson Center, which is to be developed, which is a presidential library, an archive, but also has a link with the university in Galway, the National University of Ireland in Galway, which has a very good human rights center and women's center. And also, so it would be a center of women's leadership and human rights. It's very much the vision and brainchild of the Ballina Urban District Council, of the Ballina, of the Mayo County Council, of the University in Galway, of business people in Ballina, and I was persuaded that this was a very good idea um, to uh, also rejuvenate um, the, and revitalize the town of Ballina. So we are a very resilient people in Ballina, and when Archbishop Tutu could not come, it was decided that the plaque would come to him. And that, <laughs> that he might bless it. <laughs> God, we thank you for the gift that is Mary. Thank you for all that you have accomplished in and through her and what you will still accomplish. And so, bless this plug and bless the place where it will be placed. May it be a source of inspiration and empowerment for all of your children. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the plaque reads and will be seen by everybody who comes to the centre in Ballina. Welcome to the Mary Robinson Centre, blessed by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, 7th of October 2014. It doesn't say it's his birthday, but... Um, <laughs> so. But uh, Vice-Chancellor and Rector, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Leah and the Tutu uh, family, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's truly an honour and a pleasure to be here in the University of Western Cape to deliver the fourth annual Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture. The title of my lecture is Women at the Heart of Sustainable Peace. Arch, how many times have we heard you say that the world would be a peaceful place if it were ruled by women? And I heard that already clapped this evening, so I know we're all in the same spirit here. Your record for speaking out for women's empowerment is exemplary. And uh, both in your work here in South Africa and through your foundation, you're known internationally as a champion of women. And as chair of the elders, you led with characteristic vigor our Girls Not Brides campaign. And indeed, you were recently in Zambia, still working um, on uh, that with great effect. And Leah, you've been a role model and example for women in your work for the cause of equality and women's rights and your tireless campaign to organize South Africa's domestic workers into a union to fight for equality in pay and conditions in work. You've both been an extraordinary, had an extraordinary impact on the lives of those around you and millions more, and I salute you both. Um, you also have a wonderful family. So happy birthday to you, Arch, and happy birthday to you next week, Leah. Ad multos años. <laughs> In this lecture, I want to talk about why women should be at the forefront of peace building and the kinds of initiatives that need to be taken to ensure that we are. To do this, 
I'll draw on my own experience, particularly working in the Great Lakes region of Africa. A peaceful world requires not only the end of conflict, but also the end of the kind of injustices, poverty, inequality, the risks posed by de to development by climate change that plague our world. So I'll also speak of my experience working on climate action and climate justice to discuss with you recent initiatives of women involved in leadership on climate. I'll conclude by considering the question of women's leadership, how women lead, and how we can further support each other by sharing experiences and sharing knowledge. Women's participation in the prevention resolution of conflicts is critical to building sustainable peace because no society can develop economically, politically, or socially when half of its population is marginalized. So how do we put women at the heart of sustainable peace? In the context of international law, and as was said, I did, uh, I was taught by Professor Kader Asmal, who was a great professor in this university. He left his teaching in Trinity College Dublin and came straight here to uh, Western Cape to continue that teaching. So I owe him a great deal and it's a connection with this university. Um, in the context of international law, the starting point is UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security adopted in the year 2000. This instrument stresses the importance of women's equal participation and full involvement in all efforts for the maintenance and promotion of peace and security, as well as promoting special measures to protect women and girls from gender-based violence, in particular, rape and sexual abuse. However, initially, progress was very slow and few women were appointed to senior positions in conflict situations, either by the United Nations or other bodies. In 2009, the then Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations asked me to chair a civil society advisory committee to the United Nations on Resolution 1325 to see how we could use the 10th anniversary the following year to strengthen it and demand implementation. I, in turn, very quickly asked Binta Diop, then Executive Director of FAM Africa Solidarity, to co-chair this advisory committee with me. There were 12 of us on this committee, including, I have to say, three good men. You know, when we're talking about equality, we need the men. So we had them, but in a minority. You know, just three of them out of 12. We conducted hearings during 20, 2010 in different parts of the world where we encouraged women civil society leaders to share their perspectives and an analyses. And we listened to the experiences of women working at grassroots level, seeking to participate in peacemaking and peace building. I recall one woman saying that, and I quote, a typical peace process involves bad men forgiving other bad men in fancy hotels in front of television cameras. It's pretty true. We learned about the initiatives women were taking, including pressing for national and regional plans of action under Council Resolution 1325. The United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon committed to appoint more women as his special representatives in post-conflict countries. Binta Diop and I then, while we were in Uganda, went in a helicopter to President Museveni's farm to ask him to hold a ministerial Security Council meeting on the issue in October 2010, while Uganda held the uh, Security Council chair. That was the exact 10th anniversary. It was one of the longest and best attended Security Council meetings ever, at which the participating government ministers, including US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, brought their opinions to bear, raised the profile of the issues related to women, peace and security, bringing it more into the public conscience, and agreed to strengthen significantly its application. Fast forward a little bit. When, in February 2013, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon appointed me as his special envoy for the Great Lakes region of Africa, he made it clear that he wanted for the first time to appoint a woman as a senior mediator in a conflict situation. I felt both humbled and challenged in accepting this post, but it was also clear to me that as a woman, I would somehow have to try to do it differently, to somehow show that it matters when it's a woman who's 
taking on the responsibility. I'd have to draw on my experience at work in promoting and strengthening the resolution on women, peace and security, but now it wasn't just talking about it, it was action, it was doing it, which is, as we know, much more uh, challenging. The Great Lakes region, as you well know, has been plagued for decades by political instability, armed conflicts and humanitarian crises against a backdrop of tensions over natural resources and other potentially destabilizing factors. The use of rape as a weapon of war in the conflict, the degree, methods and viciousness of the use of sexual violence have been well documented. My appointment as Special Envoy followed the adoption of the Peace, Security and Cooperation Framework for the region, signed on the 24th of February 2013 by initially 11 African heads of state and guaranteed by four institutions, the United Nations, the African Union, the Conference of the Great Lakes Region and SADC. Achieving a peace accord in itself was a remarkable feat. My role as Special Envoy would involve formulating a plan of action for heads of state to implement this framework, which I characterized as a framework of hope, with the end goal of moving towards sustainable peace in the region. The 11 heads of state, rising to 13 when Kenya and the Sudan signed up, were all men. When I asked them to each nominate somebody close to them, um, a suitable candidate to form a technical support committee to plan and to guide the oversight mechanism of the framework, all of them nominated men. Arch, my friend, women do not yet rule the world. So how to mitigate this clear gender imbalance? All the heads of state were men, and they'd appointed men to the technical support committee. Again, I turned to my friend Binta Diop, now the African Union Commission's special envoy for women, peace and security in Africa for help. She agreed to attend all meetings of the Technical Support Committee to ensure that issues of gender and women's empowerment were given priority. But we had to do more. We had to change the approach so that the process involved not just political leaders, the men, but also all of civil society, including women. And we had to be careful not to limit women's engagement in the process to the issue of gender-based violence, as that tends to continue the characterization of women as victims. Prevention of gender-based and sexual violence situations is, of course, a significant priority that requires concentrated effort by women and men in the peace-building process. But for too long in the Great Lakes region, as I believe in other situations of conflict throughout the world, women have been merely viewed as victims, not as agents of change. Women in the region have been subjected to extreme brutality, including sexual violence, during the conflict. But they've also cared for their families and emerged as leaders in their communities while the men took up arms to fight. Women have done so much groundwork, mobilizing and organizing for peace at the grassroots level. And this work needs to be acknowledged. Empowerment of women requires their full participation at all levels and on all issues of decision-making and peace-building. We had to broaden women's, ro role, women's role to include participation in the high-level negotiations, traditionally the realm of the elite men, implementation, monitoring and accountability under all aspects of the framework of hope, progress on livelihoods, development, agriculture, access to energy, political transition, reconstruction, and post-conflict justice. To counterbalance the men-only oversight mechanism and technical support committee, I initiated a parallel platform for women's voices in the region to be heard and influence the regional and national mechanisms. The women's platform, launched in January of this year, aims to provide support to women's groups that are active in four areas. Firstly, advocating for and monitoring progress on the frameworks, implementation, and plans of action under Council Resolution 1325. Secondly, combating violence against women and supporting survivors. Thirdly, supporting women's livelihoods and participation in development. And fourthly, promoting local access to clean energy. Support is provided through grants for women's organizations, convening organizations for capacity building and shared learning, and advocating with the donor community and philanthropic bodies to increase resources for women's organization. In my opinion, and I think this will be shared by many of you, 
women's organizations, especially at grassroots level, always lack resources. They are never adequately resourced. So part of the women's platform was to focus on getting resources to women who were already active on the ground. I'm pleased to say that the action plan adopted by the heads of state in January 2014 for implementation of the region's framework of hope embraces benchmarks and activities specifically pertaining to women. Women serving in local and cross-border conflict management that emphasize early warning and early response, inclusion of women in addressing sources of instability and promoting cross-border reconciliation dialogues, inclusion of women in efforts to support, advocate for, and monitor progress on the framework's implementation, women's inclu inclusion in disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration programs, and ending impunity for responding to and preventing future sexual and gender-based violence. By increasing the role of women in the peace building process at all levels, and promoting in the action plan women's inclusion in the implementation mechanisms, heads of state have made some progress in creating space for women to participate. But I do have to sound a note of caution. We are not there yet. And the work required to unravel this complex conflict, to affect political transition and reconstruction, to develop structures for post-conflict justice, and to ensure security including economic and social security, is very much ongoing work and requires continuing monitoring and scrutiny. It was a source of real joy and, I must say, relief to me that the special envoy appointed to succeed me, Saeed Jinnat, when the Secretary General appointed me as his special envoy on climate change last July, fully supports the women's platform and making women central to decision making. I think it's great when men champion women. I think to have a male special envoy for the Great Lakes who will continue the women's platform, will continue to champion women, is vital to really creating uh, uh, women's equality, as Arch has done all his life. I want to shift emphasis now for a few minutes to discuss the work I'm currently undertaking on climate change and climate justice. The physical world, our world, our home, faces potential catastrophe because of climate change, and we're running out of time to take the necessary steps. We need to rapidly and equitably make the transition to a carbon neutral world. This is the only way to avoid the consequences of a world that would be three to four degrees warmer than pre-industrial levels. Those consequences include more extreme weather, rising food insecurity, the spread of disease, higher levels of poverty and instability, and the displacement of possibly 200 million people by 2050. We need to change our economic systems, how we produce energy, how we use our land, and what natural resources, um, how we transport people and goods, and how we live, eat, and work if we're to survive. We simply cannot have a peaceful and prosperous future unless we act and act urgently on climate change. Climate action is an area where women across all sectors of society are leading the way in efforts to build resilience and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Women, like the Minister for International Relations and Cooperation of this country, uh, Maiti Nkoana Mashaban. Um, Maiti Mashaban, who calls me Mama Mary, presided over the 2011 UN Climate Change Conference COP17 in Durban. She worked extraordinarily hard and stayed with the debate right to the end, which, after a marathon session of negotiations, led to a deal being reached, the Durban Platform. This Durban Platform brings us forward to Paris in 2015, where world leaders have undertaken to agree terms to a legally binding treaty to address climate change. The deal came out of a progressive alliance, a progressive alliance of small island states, least developed countries, African states and the EU, the European Union, with South Africa coming in and bringing with it the other BRICS economies, so that finally China and the United States had no choice uh, but to participate. By a happy coincidence, three women chaired successive conferences in Copenhagen, Can Cancun, and Durban. And those three women, Connie Hedegaard, Patricia Espinosa, and Maite Mashaban, agreed to lead a troika of women leaders on gender and climate change. 
mainly women ministers of environment and energy, and we included, as always, some supportive men. My foundation organizes the Troika of Women Leaders, and we had a side event at the COP in Durban where we plotted, we literally sat and plotted to bring gender balance into all future conferences on climate and to have gender as a standing item on the agenda. We worked all that year very hard, kept in touch with each other and used the ministers to uh, ensure that this would be on the agenda. The Doha COP in 2012 was chaired by a man, but we had organized so effectively that he was willing to put the issue for negotiation. I still remember when it was put up to him in the hall after all the delegations had spoken, and it was mostly women from the various delegations who, who spoke about the need for this decision on gender balance. He put up his arms and he said, what can I do a mere man? And then he put it forward for a negotiation. It was a, it was a great moment. And, um, uh, I'll never forget the emotion in the hall when the decision was adopted to have gender balance in all delegations to the COP and in bodies such as the Green Climate Fund and to work for gender sensitive climate policy. Christiana Figueres, the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change, called it the Doha miracle as we clapped and we cheered and we hugged each other. Two weeks ago, on the eve of the New York Climate Summit, building towards COP21 in Paris in 2015, my foundation, together with UN Women, co-hosted a women's leadership forum, raising ambition for climate action. Current and former women heads of state and government, ministers, leaders from grassroots, youth and indigenous organizations, civil society, the private sector, the scientific community, and the UN system came together to demonstrate women's leadership on climate action and highlight gender responsive actions at all levels. We discussed climate actions that benefit the climate while also benefiting people and protecting their rights. Responding to climate change means doing things differently. And doing things differently means it's possible to break away from old norms. So climate action can be gender sensitive and can protect rights. It can be designed to reduce inequalities and to contribute to poverty reduction. Imagine the difference it would make to a significant portion of the world's population, over two billion, if they had light that was clean energy in their home. 1.3 billion people at the moment don't have access to electricity, they use kerosene and candles, they pay too much, and it's dangerous. 2.6 billion uh, uh, cook on open fires, on charcoal, wood, animal dung, ingest the fumes, and it's estimated that about four million people die of um, the fumes that are uh, uh, breathed in, in, in indoor uh, fumes, um, more than malaria, a huge death toll. And of course, the vast majority are women or even children uh, standing near their mother um, as she's cooking. So we could change that part of the bottom of the pyramid, so-called, with clean energy. Approaching climate change as an issue of intergenerational justice as a development and human rights issue is what climate justice is all about. Climate justice provides us with principles to inform effective and transformative actions, including participation, gender equality, the protection of human rights, including the right to development, and the need for fairness in sharing both the burdens and the benefits of climate action. By amplifying the voices of women leaders participating in the forum, we sought to inject an increased sense of urgency into government efforts to develop innovative, sustainable, and inclusive responses to the climate change challenge. Christiana Figueres, um, on a panel which I was moderating, had a very practical recommendation, which I commend to any of you that it, that it fits. She said that women in positions of authority, like her, when they come into a room dominated by women, should ask, what's wrong with this room? What's wrong with this room? She started to do that, and it's beginning to have an effect. Um, I th I'm going to do that too. I, in fact, I've already done it once to effect when I was in Berlin before coming here. Um, there was a, a proposal for a high-level body, and it was going to be all men, and I said, no, that's wrong. That, that can't be. So um, I, we, we just have to start asking, what's wrong with that room when it's too male-dominated? You hear that, Arch? You got that? <laughs> <clears throat> 
I now want to just briefly, before I conclude, talk about uh, how women lead. Um, women lead in a slightly different way. Leadership in a women's way doesn't just involve political leaders, heads of state, ministers, business leaders, and heads of agencies. It encompasses community leadership, indigenous leadership, grassroots, and youth leadership. What distinguishes leadership in a women's way is the insights of women and the willingness to encourage and mentor young women. Having now come into more opportunities for leadership, we still lead with a consciousness of how to do it, a critique of how we're doing it, a determination we'll do it better, and a reaching out to all of those who exercise leadership. Women are more comfortable linking with their counterparts because we all profoundly understand that the issues are more important than the individual. There might be just a little bit less ego around. We need to work further to ensure that we have a leadership that connects the various ways in which we come together, communicating and collaborating, sharing experiences, sharing knowledge to make a difference. There was a very special moment during the opening ceremony of the Climate Summit in New York on the 23rd of September, when a woman from the Marshall Islands, Kathy Gentle Kedgner, spoke and then read her poem. I had met this 26-year-old on the Climate March and she's an exceptional young leader. What I liked was that she spoke to us as a leader and a mother, telling her baby, and I quote from her poem, I take this moment to apologize to you. We are drawing the line here because baby, we are going to fight. At the concluding ceremony of the Climate Summit, another great woman leader spoke, and she spoke on behalf of the elders. Grasso Michelle judged well the message she wanted to convey. There was a self-congratulatory mood in the hall, and she reminded the heads of state and the delegates gathered about courage, leadership, and obligation. And she told them bluntly, and I quote her, I have the impression that there is a huge mismatch between the magnitude of the challenge and the response that we have heard here today. She told them, that they need to go back to the drawing board and ask hard questions and to step up ambition. You know, just watching her speaking to that crowded full assembly hall with 126 heads of state and many senior ministers there and having her say, go back to the drawing boards, you haven't done it. And it was necessary because there was a feeling that people having come and spoken, that was it, that was enough. And she was saying, no, the magnitude of the problem and you have not done enough, go back and ask yourself hard questions. That to me was real leadership, um, extraordinary leadership. And it was so appreciated by civil society, which had been worried that uh, the, the mood would be one of, of self-congratulation rather than realizing that there's much still to be done. So in conclusion, let me borrow yet again a phrase that I heard Arch use when we were on a panel together in New York a few years ago. Arch was speaking with his usual animation and enthusiasm. His arms were flying all over the place. He was full of whatever he was talking about, very enthusiastic about it. And a woman journal, journalist accosted him uh, with a question. Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? And he looked at her and he shook his head and he said, no dearie, I'm not an optimist. I'm a prisoner of hope. <laughs> a prisoner of hope, that's a good way to remain hopeful in the face of such terrible outrages and human rights violations in our world today. And I am particularly hopeful that women will take their rightful place in the 21st century and that this will make all the difference. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>